All right. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Max Schulicker, uh, professor of electrical engineering and computer science, joined MIT in uh, 2016. Uh, he has uh, recently arrived at MIT, but he's done amazing work in manipulating nanoscale. Uh, he'll present on tr how to transform nanotechnologies into applications, focusing on many different ways that nanotech can be used to make large area sensing technologies. Please, <coughs> let me help you out with this. Yep. All right. Okay, well, thanks for the uh, introduction and for the invitation to speak here today. I'm uh, tremendously excited to be speaking about how we can uh, transform new emerging nanotechnologies, which were mainly just of scientific interest, into the foundation for realizing new and exciting applications. So we all know that data makes the world go around, so to speak. And with the exponentially growing availability of big and abundant data, which is being generated from trillions of sensors, which will soon be connected across the internet of everything or the cloud, electronics and sensing has the potential to continue to have a dramatic impact in our lives with applications that range from genomics for personalized healthcare to building smarter cities, science, finance, security, the list is nearly endless. And while it might seem that such a broad range of applications share very little in common with one another, they actually all share a very important common thread, which is that their demand for more data, more computation, more energy efficiency, throughput, personalization, sensitivity, are all exceeding the capabilities of what electronics today can deliver. And the reason why electronics can no longer keep up with these growing demands of these applications is because electronics aren't just hitting one or two walls, but rather many walls all simultaneously. Right? There's the data deluge, which refers to the fact that there's so many sensors generating so much data at such a fast rate that electronics simply can't keep up. I did a quick calculation before coming up here. In the minute that I've been speaking so far, uh, the world has created about 694 terabytes, give or take a few, of information which all needs to be processed in near real time, which unfortunately isn't happening because of this other wall called the power wall, uh, which uh, refers to the fact that the underlying computation, the underlying transistors themselves, are no longer improving. Then there's also the memory wall, or the memory logic bandwidth wall, which refers to how a processor today can spend the vast majority of its time and energy just moving data around a system, from off-chip sensors to off-chip memory to the processor, back to the memory again, time and energy spent not even doing useful computation. And the list of walls goes on and on. There's the uh, uh, interconnect wall, complexity wall, resiliency wall, communication wall, and so on and so forth. So the question is, given all of these obstacles, how can we possibly enable these new exciting applications? I mean, does the answer lie in building a new sensor, maybe a new transistor, a new architecture, or maybe a new algorithm? Unfortunately not. I think it's clear that just focusing on one solution to solve one problem is not going to overcome all of these walls. Rather, we have to have coordinated advances across the entire system stack, or in a word, build nanosystems in order to enable these new applications. So what exactly is a nanosystem? It's a good question, so let me show you. So a nanosystem is when we start by taking new emerging nanotechnologies. As you'll hear today and have heard already, these enable new types of devices, new fabrication techniques, new types of sensors, et cetera. And only by first overcoming inherent imperfections, such as large-scale fabrication, variability, can we then actually make use of these benefits, allowing us to combine them all in order to realize revolutionary new system architectures, which in turn can be, enabled, uh, can be used to enable a whole new class of future applications, such as big abundant data applications. Now, while each sphere of work here is still very important and necessary in its own right, it's only by connecting and combining the right emerging technologies with the right system architectures for the right applications, which allow us to achieve truly massive benefits. Now, this is admittedly abstract, so let me give you a very concrete example. So this is what an electronic system looks like today. Computation is on a 2D chip. Off to the side, we have a package sensor. And off somewhere else, we have a memory chip with very limited data bandwidth uh, communicating between these different parts of our system. And here is a futuristic nanosystem where we have multiple layers of computation built directly on top of one another, interleaved with layers of memory. We can even add increased functionality like massively parallel sensing directly onto the top layer of this chip. 
all densely integrated in this 3D stack through very fine-grained vertical interconnects, truly embodying now computation finely immersed with memory, finely immersed with sensing. And the reason why this is a feature nanosystem is that while this type of system would be impossible to build with today's silicon-based technologies, today I will show you how by leveraging heterogeneous integration of multiple emerging nanotechnologies that we can actually build these systems today. And I want to be crystal clear here that everything I've drawn on the board, including this schematic, is not just some dream or some fanciful vision, but we've actually designed, uh, built, and tested and have these chips, including this one, working in our lab today. So this is very, very real. Okay, so if we want to begin building a nanosystem, how do we do that? Well, we have to start with a promising emerging nanotechnology. And the technology, one of the technologies which we focus on in my group, are called carbon nanotubes. So a carbon nanotube, or CNT, is just a rolled up sheet of graphene to form a nanocylinder with a diameter of around one, one and a half nanometers. A carbon nanotube field effect transistor, or a CNFET, is formed by using the CNTs as the channel of the transistor with traditional lithographically defined source drain and gate region. So I've drawn the schematic here. Uh, so picture your silicon transistor, just remove the silicon in the channel, replace that with carbon nanotubes, everything else stays exactly the same. Now the motivation for using carbon nanotubes for future sensing systems is drawn uh, from two different points. On the one hand, uh, carbon nanotubes make excellent ideal transistors. In fact, it's projected that if you could build a large scale system using carbon nanotubes, then that system would be over 10 times, over an order of magnitude more energy efficient than the exact same system made from today's silicon transistors. And moreover, not only do carbon nanotubes make ideal transistors, but these transistors also make ideal sensors. And you'll hear more about this later from Professor Swagger. So now that we know why we want to use carbon nanotubes, how do we go about building a circuit or building sensors out of them? Well, let me show you. This is a schematic of the simplest circuit, just an inverter. You have P type C and FETs in the pull up network, N type C and FETs in the pull down network, and the design follows any traditional CMOS design flow. Now, to make a sensor, we simply functionalize the CNTs and some of these CN FETs. Uh, where the functionalization on top of the carbon nanotubes is what defines the sensor selectivity and sensitivity. Now, I have to burst the bubble, right? Because despite the promise of carbon nanotubes, uh, there's always a catch, right? And the catch here is that it's very difficult to build any sort of working system out of them. Uh, like many, if not all, emerging nanomaterials, carbon nanotubes are subject to substantial inherent imperfections and variations which have made realizing working systems and, and sensors uh, infeasible in the past. Now, for the sake of time, I, I'm not going to go through all the details of these imperfections, and nor am I going to go through the details of all the solutions we've developed to overcome these. But I do want to highlight that the key to overcoming these obstacles and enabling us to build systems with these new technologies is to rely on a combination of both processing techniques we develop in the lab and circuit design techniques which allow us to both build and design circuits and systems in such a way to guarantee mathematically that they are immune to these imperfections. Now, since I'm not going to go through the details of these techniques, I still want to show you that they work. And ultimately, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Uh, so here, uh, I'm showing you we can actually build complex digital systems using carbon nanotubes, such as a basic computer. Uh, it's a, a turn complete machine. Uh, it uh, runs a basic operating operate system scheduler capable of even multitasking. Not only can we build actual working systems, we can build a wide range of different sensors. Here, these are a whole bunch of different gas sensors. So you can make liquid sensors, uh, stress sensors, optical sensors, really the whole gamut of sensors. Okay, so now that we can use these new technologies to build systems, to make different types of sensors, we can make a better circuit, we can make a new sensor. But how do we do even better, right? How do we really start to enable new applications? Well, if we want to do even better, we need to combine the benefits we can achieve at the device scale with the benefits we can leverage at the system or architectural level. And to that end, 3D integration is a very promising path. Now, 3D integration today is achieved through chip stacking. This is when you build the different vertical layers of the system on different 2D substrates, and then physically stack and bond them one on top of each other using through silicon vias or TSVs to connect these vertical layers. And these TSVs are very, very large and very, very sparse. Now, what I'm going to show you experimentally is the dream of 3D, monolithic 3D integration. This is when we can build these layers directly on top of one another, all on the same starting substrate. 
No way for bonding required. Now, due to this monolithic integration, we can use our nanoscale interlayer views, or ILVs, to connect the different vertical layers of the chip. And these ILVs are orders of magnitudes. I'm talking more than 1,000 x denser than TSP. And where we can really leverage this massive increase in vertical connectivity is not just stacking layers of logic on top of logic, but rather stacking layers of logic on top of memory on top of sensing. Because now this massive increase in physical connectivity directly translates into an equally large increase in our bandwidth from logic, memory, and sensing. And this provides serious positive impacts for our system, both in terms of energy and performance. Now again, there's always a catch, right? And the catch here is that it's very difficult to build working systems uh, for models of 3D. Because the processing temperatures in all these upper layers has to be very low temperature, below 400 degrees C. If you go above 400 degrees C, you'll damage the bottom layer devices and just melt all the metal wires on the back end. This is particularly a challenge for today's silicon CMOS, which has processing temperatures in excess of over 1,000 degrees C for steps such as dope activation needle. So this is where we can really leverage these emerging technologies, many of which can be processed at very low temperatures. For logic and sensing, we can use carbon nanotubes, as I mentioned, a promising and realistic technology now. For memory, there's a whole host of new memories to choose from, RMS, TTRAM, CBRAM. But you choose whatever is best for your application. And what I really want to emphasize about this approach is that now we really do get the combined benefits of using these energy efficient devices, new types of sensors, and these energy efficient high performing architectures, which are naturally enabled by using these new devices to begin with. And while I think this vision is exciting, while I think it's compelling, what I think is the most exciting part of this is that we can actually already build these today. So I'm very excited to show you. This is our most recent experimental demonstration, 3D nanosystem. It will be published in just a couple of weeks. So this is a sneak peek. Uh, it's, uh, the first monolithic 3D IC integrating logic, memory, and sensing. To give you an idea of scale, it incorporates over 2 million CN FETs, over 1 million RM memory cells, all built over millions of silicon FETs, all fabricated in-house in a fabrication facility. Um, I really want to emphasize that this has actually uh, been built and tested. Here you see one such completed wafer where there are eight of these different chips on there. I actually uh, brought one with me here today, so you're free to take a look at it afterwards. Um, so let me show you what's actually inside this chip, how we make it, and most importantly, what it even does. So we start with our blank silicon substrate, just like normal, and we build a bottom layer of logic. Uh, we make this out of silicon CMOS, and I want to stop here and make two extremely important points. The first is that the silicon can only be on the bottom layer, nowhere else in the stack because it's so high temperature to fabricate. The second point is why do we make this out of silicon? It's not because we have to. We choose to build this out of silicon to explicitly demonstrate for you that everything you've seen here today is not just you know, wafer scale, et cetera, but also silicon CMOS compatible, meaning that it can be built directly on top of any starting silicon substrate that you can buy from any foundry today. It's very important when considering the adoption of a new technology. Okay, between every layer of the chip, we repeat the same steps. We passivate it with a dielectric, an ILD, we then actually fill in these very dense ILVs. I'll emphasize that these are extremely dense because this is monolithic 3D integration. For the next layer of the chip, we build a layer of logic using carbon nanotubes. It serves two purposes. It acts as a uh, memory access circuitry for the layers of memory we'll be building on top shortly. And we also build some mini classification accelerators for on-chip embedded computation. I'll show you more on this shortly as well. Again, between layers, ILD, ILVs. For the third layer, we build a layer of memory using RM. On top of that, ILDs, ILVs, and the fourth and final layer of logic using CNT. If you zoom in on the SCM, you can even see within the channel length of one of these transistors our nice, pristine carbon nanotube. Now I want to go one step further. And to demonstrate the increased functionality that can be leveraged from these new materials that make both great transistors and great sensors, we'll go ahead and functionalize some of these transistors to turn them into gas sensors. So now we have over one million unique gas sensors built directly onto the top layer of this chip. And we take a look at these types of systems, which have millions of sensors, which connect directly in parallel through millions of interconnects to massive on-chip memory, which then has computation built directly underneath that, connected to the memory through millions of interconnects as well. These types of systems can and do already capture terabytes of information each second from the outside world, store this uh, mass amount of data in on-chip memory, and then compute on it by the logic right underneath that, all in real time, transforming this massive data input into highly processed, useful information. And again, this chip actually uh, works. We can test it. We load it inside a little vacuum test chamber, allow us to bubble vapors from whatever sort of liquids we want to test. 
This is raw data measured from a chip. Uh, a white pixel here is if one sensor wrote a zero into its memory cell underneath. A black pixel is if a different sensor wrote a one into its memory cell. Here I'm showing you results for just over 2,000 of these sensor memory cells. Remember the chip has over a million of them though. But just by looking at the small sample size, you already visually see a difference in response between lemon juice vapors and rubbing alcohol vapors. Uh, and importantly, not only does this chip generate a massive amount of information, it also computes on it using those CNFET-based classification accelerators. Again, this is measured data from one of these systems, where it's actually calculating two different features to be used for a support vector machine, for classification between what it's smelling in the atmosphere. Uh, we can actually do a PCA analysis on these features and show the ability for this chip to correctly distinguish and classify between pretty much whatever liquid we had lying around in the lab, you know, vodka, wine, beer, rubbing alcohol, <laughs> vinegar, lemon juice, whatever, right? And yes, if you go in my lab and see all this booze, it's for the experiments. Um, okay, now while chemical sensing is, is certainly a, a, you know, a cool demonstration, being able to tell different wines and beers and whatnot, it really is not the point. I want to make sure that when you leave today, you do not turn to your neighbor and say, hey, we saw a pretty cool gas sensor. Because the takeaway message from 3D Nanosystem is so much deeper than that, right? 3D Nanosystem is a platform, it's a demonstration for what future sensing systems have to look like. Because if you think about what's really required to enable these new applications, we know we need to have very energy efficient logic and memory to do that computation. And we can achieve that by heterogeneously integrating new technologies both for logic and for memory. But we also know that just technology and computation is not enough. We also know, need very high bandwidth communication between these layers of logic, memory, and even sensing. And to that end, we can use monolithic 3D integration, which is enabled by these technologies to provide very fine-grained vertical interconnects between the layers of, the, the, of these chips. And importantly, we just don't want systems to do computation. We want them to interact with the world and, and compute on data generated from millions of sensors. If we don't want to create the data deluge we already suffer from today, we want to bring the sensing as close to the computation and memory as possible, which we can do by leveraging the increased functionality from these new materials, which make both great transistors and great sensors. And these, these are the major takeaways uh, from this demonstration. Okay, so what's next? Well, I'm uh, really excited to say that my students are working on V2.0 of these types of systems in collaboration with analog devices and restoring collaboration with MGH. We're actually using these sips, uh, chips in real hospital settings to do applications which you actually cannot do using today's hardware. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, wrap up my talk. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors, uh, Kirkland Analog Devices, uh, and of course, uh, all my students who, uh, it's really been uh, the, the privilege of my uh, short life so far uh, to work for them. <laughs> and I said that in the right order, I work for them. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Of